right, folks. Lovely to see you all. I'm so excited. Um, let's get started because, you know, we have a lot to get through in a very short period of time. Um, so welcome, welcome all of you. Six million adults identify as Afro-Latine. Um, this conversation today um, is for those who identify as Afro-Latine and, or if you want to learn more about people who identify as Afro-Latine. We have two incredible panelists with, here with us to be able to share about their um, experience and identity. Um, I'm gonna do a quick little bio on each of them and then pass the mic over for anything that I may have missed. Um, but yes, uh, first, I want to introduce uh, Elisa Legri. Oh my God! I just <laughs> you got to roll the R's, girl. I don't know what is happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elisa Legri, and um, Elisa is an award-winning systems engineering leader with two decades of technical experience, including management consulting, operations, and pre-sale engineering. She possesses a confident mix of technical acumen leadership excellence and the ability to create elite performing teams y'all she said elite okay <laughs> um where inclusivity and culture are a priority um at least as a national educate uh, education director of systems engineering at palo alto network where she leads a team of cybersecurity systems engineer let us give a round of applause for Lisa joining us thank you so, <laughs> um and before we move on, we, we pass the mic over to our panelists. I also want to introduce Jesse Santana. Jesse is an inclusive leadership coach and organizational cultural strategist who empowers uh, advocate leaders to create brave spaces of intentional inclusivity. There, there, there is no like, there, we're not out here trying to just be like stereotypical and all that. We're being intentional about our inclusivity here and fierce belonging. Um, by facilitating workshops, fostering community building, and hosting brave conversations, um, Jesse helps leaders engage in the workforce and innovative teams for a more inclusive and thriving organizational culture. Listen, we got a powerhouse team here, and I'm really get excited to get things started. Um, Adisa, Jesse, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Is there anything here. I missed in this intro of y'all? No, you said it all. I think it was great. Yes, Thank that was good. That was good. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, we have we have an addition that I don't think is part of our team. Love having you here, but you can join us in the uh, in the space. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's let's get started. You know, when someone asks you about your identity and what you identify, are you direct with saying that you're Afro Latina? Yeah, I'll start if you don't mind, Jesse. Um, I think for me, uh, it's been easier lately, right? I'll just be completely honest and transparent because growing up, I mean, I grew up in New York like you, like where you are, right? And it's easier in those communities. But when you come to the South, where I am now in Atlanta, it's a little harder for people to really comprehend what Afro-Latina is and what it means and what it encompasses, right? And it's just a matter of saying, hey, this is something that we've now identified that we could actually all relate to. It makes me feel whole. So when people ask me now, I say, yes, I am Afro-Latina. I embed the mix of my Black Caribbean father and my Latina mother, uh, both born and raised in Panama. I mean, myself, born and raised in, pa well, born in Panama, I raised in New York. Um, so it, it's a mixture of those two cultures that makes me whole, and I'm happy to identify with it. Yeah, Thanks. that's beautiful. Um, for me, I would agree. As a kid, I would say things like, um, yes, I'm mixed, but I'm Dominican, so it's kind of different. Um, yeah. But <laughs> I had a friend, Patrice Palmer, whose family comes from Gullah, South Carolina, and they told me the only difference between us is really that we speak the language of our colonizers. Mm -hmm. And when, she, when they said that, I, I was that. like, ooh, that hit me right in the heart. Yes. <laughs> and it took me a long time, especially, you know, I, it, I facilitate, I talk, I speak, and I find that I say, ah, yes, I'm a light-skinned Afro-Latina because <laughs> I've lived in different parts of the world where when I was in China for six years, people thought I was Indian. I live in French Quebec, think people think I'm Muslim. 
And so all of these assumptions of my identity everywhere that I've been have sort of, you know, now we're at a place, I think, societally when, when I can be like, yes, this is who I am. This is, I'm not choosing my linguistic identity anymore. I'm choosing my ethnic one and I'm proud of it and I love it and all of the things that come with it. Yes, I could not agree more. Choosing to be made whole is is super important and it's, it just makes you feel like, hey, I'm here, right? And I've arrived. You no longer exactly. have to do that. Exactly. Yeah. Like you said, well said, Jesse. Like, yeah. I mean, what's what I'm taking away from both of you is, you know, the as as you've come into yourselves, you've been able to like remove the qualifiers. Um and mm-hmm. talking about your identity. You don't need to prove to anybody mm-hmm. like who you are, you just are. And um, thank you so much for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you, what does it mean to be Afro-Latina? Hmm. Elisa, do you wanna go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, what it means, I think, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Elizabeth Acevedo's Afro-Latina's poem. If you have not heard it, please go listen to it now. I mean, it really empowers like what I wish I could be a direct representation of that poem as a whole. It just, to me, language, my first language was Spanish, right? That's what I learned in the house. And then once I moved to New York City as a kid, as a six or seven year old, um, leaving my Hispanic roots behind and coming to this cultural melting pot where you know I was first seen as a black as a black girl, and now a black woman, but you know knowing that deep inside of me there lives this whole entire ethnic, you know, ethnic ethnical culture that I want to fully embrace and share with the world. Right, it's not easily identified when you first look at me, right? But what it means to be Afro Latina is all of that. It's all encompassing. Right, my my ethnic roots as well as my racial roots. Um, knowing that I that my father's family was part of that transatlantic slave trade, right? Knowing that that's where I derived from, and there's history there, but still embodying and encompassing all the Latina roots of you know my my mom's mom is from Colombia, and I've actually went to Colombia and identifying with that community and seeing what made me whole. It really made me dig into my past and my history to try to really seek, sip into my roots and, and know what makes up this Afro-Latina person that is a Dilsa that, it, you know, that I embody and represent each and every day. It, it just means proud. If I could summarize it all in one word, it just means proud. I, I love all of those things because I feel like I have had a similar sort of journey. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people in my family, like in Dominican Republic, like I just knew people as family or like we were all different shades and different, all of the things. And I used to hear stories like my father, you know, saying things like, oh, your mother married me because she wanted to have whiter babies. And I'm like, you're the product of your marriage. That kind of fits with me weird. Um, yeah. But also, you know, the fact that my father, even though he's the lighter one, he has features that are not as fine as my mother, right? Not, mm-hmm. And so I did my history, you know, my ancestral chart and I put it on Facebook because I was crazy and young. Um, and the first <laughs> comment that I got was like, oh my God, Jesse, I've never seen anybody's, you know, ancestry DNA look and cover so many different countries. And I'm like, welcome to the history of colonization and slavery, where you've been. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> having to always, um, I feel like I've always had to sort of explain that. I didn't know the words because I was a kid growing up, especially like Sarah mentioned, you know, I was growing up in Vegas where if I spoke Spanish, everyone was like, immediately, you you must be Mexican. And I'm like, no, there's a whole bunch of other people that speak Spanish in the world. Mm-hmm. And even like last week, my daughter had cultural day at her school. And so she, my mother handmade a Dominican traditional dress for her. And Aww. even though my daughter presents as Asian, because her father's Chinese, like she had the little Dominican flag and she's like, I'm a Dominican girl. (laughs) (laughs) And it was this really, you know, like there's so much to all of the things uh, when you have all of this varied and rich history. And that's Mm -hmm. the part that I love is being able to ask access all of that 
knowledge and information and and connect with people like I live in Montreal Quebec and I find mm -hmm. that I every time I hear like a little Dominican twang I'm always like oh where's that coming where's from that coming? <laughs> your eyes like your eyes go well, where is it <laughs> exactly even in China like I would mm -hmm. hear like people talking I'm like oh like I need to be where you are <laughs> mm -hmm. Having a little aerial moment. Yeah. Where the people are. Yeah. <laughs> but like you oh. find those pockets of, of community. Um, and that's, that's, even though I've lived in different places, like you, you find a way to interconnect and weave and just, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of it um, with all of the nuances and being Afro-Latina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I swear this, this, conversations healing a lot of my inner child because so much of my experiences um, with my own identity is reflected in the stories that y'all are sharing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's really important to like be representation and be vocal about your identity. Um, and so I know that in the work that you're doing, like uh, Edusa, you know, you are someone who hires teams, who runs teams. Jesse, you work with a lot of leaders to ensure that they're having inclusivity. I'd love to know a little bit more about what are the pathways that you feel like you've created, big or small, for uh, folks from the Latina community, Afro Latina community? Yeah, <clears throat> I guess I'll go first. I think the responsibility of being the first, and maybe even some of the, a lot of the times, the only. That's a huge responsibility for someone, you know, like us, like Jesse and myself, to chart that path and carve the way for the people behind us. Um, but it means for it means that someone has to do the work. Someone was before me paving the way from a black perspective, maybe not from a Latina perspective. But now here I am paving the way for that Afro Latina that's coming behind me or Latino that's coming behind me. Right. Seeking opportunities uh, in tech. I, I was reading an article yesterday and it said that uh, most tech companies are around what eight percent black. Jesse, correct me if I'm wrong. Seven percent Latina. I mean, I'm sorry. I have it. I have it the other way around. Eight yeah. percent Latina and seven percent black. I think the 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 black community has a lower percentage in the tech space. Um, and two percent so, Latina. And oh wow. So I mean, what what what, what do I represent? Like 05 percent, right? Afro Latinas in tech. Uh, it, it's just time, right? It's time for companies to do the work to really start initiatives like the one Jesse is running uh, in their HR communities and in their inclusion and diversity communities to really seek out talent because we're out there. Um, and for me, having and holding this this uh, responsibility is something that I don't take you know lightly. It's something that I take very seriously because. I am making the way I'm very vocal about who I am and what I do. And I want to make sure that people see that there is a pathway to get here. Um, and I share those stories all the time. You know, I'm very advocate and a, a huge advocate for STEM communities and, and public schools. Actually, my business is in education. So I speak at public schools. I speak at, I speak at private schools and letting them know there's a space here for you in technology. Um, and don't be intimidated by the fact that when you're looking out there, when you're looking for the jobs, you know, maybe the hiring managers may not look like you, um, but they have people that do in their communities and in their spaces that they can reach out to to make you feel comfortable, to make you know that you are needed, wanted. And it's a requirement for this company to really chart their path to make sure that they have a space and they feel safe in that space. Yeah, I, I mean... So I always say that um, my mother always told me that you can't invite people over if your house is dirty and a lot of organizations' houses are filthy, right? Yeah, and so oh, I love that. Making sure <laughs> I love that. that. We're not just inviting people looking to diversity pipelines in order to fix the problems, especially mm -hmm. in tech. Um, for me, I also look at it through economic you know, lenses and you know, somebody shared in the in the chat earlier, 3.2 trillion, which is actually ahead of the UK and India in economic power, which is like a whole country. So, wow. you know, we have, you know, yes, technology and working in tech is definitely a vehicle for for growth and wealth, but it's all, but so is entrepreneurship. And so for me, 
I'm a board member of a, a nonprofit Wisdom Learning Counselors Institute that focuses and supports entrepreneurs, BIPOC entrepreneurs with technical solutions. And so, you know, I'm always in these circles around economics and entrepreneurship because it is important to have these conversations, um, especially around wealth management and financial literacy and figuring out, you know, does that degree, do I need to get that degree, get all this money for, uh, like I'm still paying student loans, um, especially yeah. <laughs> this month. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, making sure that, you know, we're, we're aligning ourselves to what, what the actual market needs are you know those workforce development trends are there for a reason and then also making sure that we're you know we're telling our stories and we're making space like Adisa said for others to come up behind us because um you know like I had a friend who who wrote a book called Goody about his you know his mother who was an indentured serv servant in Jamaica made her way to the UK got educated um then went to Canada and then the US and they're now working on, you know, bringing that education into public schools. And so making sure that we're telling our stories, he said, you know, no one is coming to save us. And so we have to be a part of the solution, a part of the impact. When I first started doing this work, um, people didn't, people were like, you know, companies don't want to hear this. Like, I was like afraid to do this work. And since doing it on intentionally, because the reality is, by just being in the room, you are doing diversity and inclusion work. <laughs> like yeah. that's the real. <laughs> yeah. But for me, it was when I started doing it intentionally, a lot of people were like, nobody, like organizations don't want to hear, they don't want to change, you know, and this was 2018. And the reality is they need to because our demographics societally are changing. Are the way that we're, you know, making money. Multinationals are it's a it's an, a real thing where we're bringing talent from other parts of the world to come here, fill the gaps that we have, and then so therefore, how do we then increase our labor market? Make sure that we're getting that talent. We want to be an employer of choice. Whatever the the things are that they're saying is why they want to do it. Right. <laughs> yeah. But being a part of the conversation and making sure that they realize, you know, yes. We do have the talent. Yes, we do have, you know, the skills and we need to be a part of those conversations and making space for those conversations and not being afraid and being intimidated like I was uh, in my early 20s, just sitting down, doing good work, hoping somebody would notice, um, but getting out there and making sure that they know that we're here. Yeah, I think you made a good point there, Jesse. It is it is the, the work when we show up in our spaces, It that's the work, right? The fact that we are showing up um, and making space for someone else to to see you in that space where you are working and you're representing your community. That's that's Absolutely. the way. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize that you're actually there putting in the work when you show up and represent you yourself as a whole. As, mm -hmm. as an Afro-Latina for me, I am showing up each and every day and representing me and hoping that people see that and see that, hey, there is a space and there is a place for me to be successful in tech. Mm -hmm. I um, am so grateful for, for your responses because you're really hitting on a lot of what's important, not just for our community as a whole, but especially at Thekeria because we're wanting to ensure that we're creating spaces where folks feel as though they are able to get support and resources from the community. And you two have been integral in mm -hmm. making sure that those spaces exist both in where you're working, but you're, you're reverberating that across the community by the people you work with. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to know a little bit of, of who might have done that for you. Were there any mentors or or folks that really helped you come into your own as you were moving through your career? So, it's okay, but so no, I just saw Jesse. <laughs> Jesse. I don't know about that. <laughs> so I thought about this question a lot um, because I will admit I had more mentors outside of Latinidad than I had in it. Um, and because of the spaces I was in, like after high school, my high school was like 90% BIPOC. And then I went to school in upstate New York <laughs> where it was like 13%. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and then I went to work in my twenties in China where, you know, I learned to love my hair in China because people were like, oh, is it natural? Like, like, uh, and I was like, that was the first time where I like wasn't doing rollers and wasn't straightening my hair and wasn't doing all the things that I, you know, was doing to my hair um, in order to fit in. 
but I think that one of my greatest privileges has actually been doing an oral history project with my 93 year old black grandmother and mm -hmm. hearing all of her stories and her experiences and hearing, you know, how far our family has come, but especially sort of hearing the echoes of the language that she uses that I've heard in my mother and that I try to catch myself not saying or repeating to my child um, because that's how we break barriers and don't limit ourselves by our circumstances, but believe in our possibility. And I think that, you know, I have, I, I want there to be more instances where we are supporting each other, where we are, you know, um, not sort of going against each other for the same resources because that's how, you know, systems win. <laughs> um, and making sure that, yeah, we're creating a culture where, you know, even if we have different experiences, we are collectively trying to break barriers. Yeah, oh, man, I love, I love that. I just, I just have to co-sign on that. It's, you're right. I didn't have anyone ahead of me that looked like me or, you know, operated in the same space from an Afro-Latina perspective or from a Latina perspective or not even a black perspective, right? I mean, I'll, I'll go across the spectrum. Yeah. There were there were people in rooms and spaces that gave me an opportunity. They, none of them looked like me. Um, and, you know, that's unfortunate in tech, but that's the, that's the reality. Um, and it, it's our jobs to, you know, start to do the, doing the work as we discussed before. My mentors of strong, positive women were just like Jesse said, my grandmother, my aunt, my mom, you know, who did hard work, laborious work, right? My mom was a maid for years in New York City and just seeing her show up and go to work every day was something that gave me the, the, uh, the energy to get up and face what I was facing in tech every day, right? And, and being uh, able to do the work to make, make a different path for my children, right? And uh, so those are the women that mentored me, the people that endured way more pain, way more hardship, way more laborious work than I endure each and every day. And that's what keeps me going. Mm -hmm. I I just want to also take a moment of just appreciating you both as trailblazers in the space. You know, being able to get that strength from your lineage, honestly, mm -hmm. and being able to to um, break generational curses and also just like provide opportunities for others to be able to see themselves in you. Like, I I'm grateful for the fact that you all are in this space um, with us. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do want to name because like we talked a lot about all this work that you're doing and and it it is tough to be in spaces and being the only and having to 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 as you would say clean house for folks. Um but let's talk a little bit about things that you know that bring joy, give a little self-care. Um, you know, I'm just also looking at the back of the he says up of on the wall with with the whole globe behind her. So yeah. to know a little bit about like when you're ready to relax, when you're ready to chill, what's your favorite vacation spot? Ooh, favorite. I have so many. I just came back from Costa Rica, actually. Hey, <laughs> yes. I was in San Jose by the volcanoes with one friend that doesn't like to do any pura vida. That's right, Natalie. <laughs> it was it was just pure joy. Pura vida. I mean, I was in heaven. I did nothing but sit in the uh, in the volcanic. Uh, what is it? The they call it the uh, the waters that were trench. Uh, I can't remember <laughs> at this point, but it was just amazing. The heated uh, hot the hot springs. Hot springs. There you go. Yes, those. That was. It was just amazing to be there. I spent three days there, just pure joy. So I think Costa Rica is now my favorite place. I love that. Yeah, that's I mean, I'm jealous right now, but um, <laughs> <laughs> mine similar. I went to Koh Chang Island in Thailand uh, many Love years Thailand. ago, and um, they were actually having a coup, a military coup at the time. So like all of the tourists canceled and we had like a cabana on the beach like we wouldn't have been able to afford <laughs> if that wasn't going on. 
Um, there was little traffic, like it was beautiful. Uh, my, my then boyfriend, now husband, it was our first international trip. So it was, it was amazing. We got to like do all the things that we wouldn't have been able to do because other people were afraid. Even though the only incident was like, there was a, an armed guard who like checked in on the inside of the van we were traveling in to see who we were. Um, but I mean, if you, if you're in a, in a place where sometimes there's economic turbulence that, that could happen anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so why not take the trip? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, you know, just a note, go <laughs> after a military coup, things will be <laughs> fine service. <laughs> um, that's a little risky, man. <laughs> that was prior to a little bit. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, y'all are inspiring me on to like where I need to go next because you know life be lifing, and you know we mm -hmm. all we always. That's right. um, That's right. With the little bit of time we have left, I'm curious: does anybody in our chat have any questions for our amazing panelists? Let's see if there's anything in the Q and A. Nothing yet. Mm -hmm. um, as we're here, I'm curious to. Do either of you have questions for each other? <laughs> I just I just loved what, you know, Jesse embodies in the work that she's doing because it's super important, right? A lot of times we don't have people in DNI that are represent representatives of a diverse uh community, which is crazy to me, right? I'm like, how do you how can you identify or how can you relate to what the uh corporations need, especially in tech, if you're not representing that group? yourself and so the fact that you're there jesse doing the work i really i just want to thank you for doing it it's super important a lot of times um when you're in technology and you're represent representing your group your whether it's ethnic or racial you're the one that has to do the work right because of what i just said there yeah. there's no one in that place to do the work for you so i just appreciate the work that you're doing well, thank you. And I mean, I appreciate the work you're doing. Any person that can work in hard tech, um, <laughs> like I call myself a not a tech enabled founder, um, but the work that you are able to do and the teams that you're able to lead and the space that you're able to take up. And like you said, be a representation for those that come behind, you know, even if they, they use you in the marketing material, which they should because you look cute. Um, <laughs> Thank you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> they need to be having, you know, that conversation of what does it mean to have more representation? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I remember I, I was doing a, a talk on exclusive leadership and there was a woman who came up to me and she's like, you're the first non-white person <laughs> to ever come talk to our group. And exactly. I was like, for shame. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. it. Well, listen, um, oh. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I was getting set up. I just, anyways, first okay. and foremost, I am not Afro Latina. I'm just, well, I think I wanted to join this one to be an ally and also to, I kind of feel like the only way I can, I can somewhat understand what it means to be in that space is being Mexican American. I don't feel fully Mexican or fully American or what does it mean to be American, right? Um, but first and foremost, it's an honor to be in this space. And Adisa, Thank you. Adisa, I'm so glad that I got to join this and to meet you, even if it is virtually, because you are goals. You are an inspiration. I am a recent um, boot camp graduate. Um, so I specialize in front end development and I really enjoyed it. I'm passionate about it, but I'm trying to break into the um, cybersecurity um, field. So what advice would you give to someone like me? And also, I really want to find um, an internship or ideally a space where I can get paid to learn. That's love, love it. really difficult to try to have a full-time job and you know stay committed to the process when there's other avenues to, or, or other ways to go about it. If that makes sense. I love it. I think um, doing your research on cybersecurity companies is the best way to start um, and seeing who they who they have in leadership. We're hiring at Palo Alto, especially for our internship program right now. Send me your resume. Look, look me up on LinkedIn. 
and we can have a conversation. But yes, I think it's all about connecting with people in the spaces where you want to be and doing your research. That's that's my best advice because you don't know where you want to be until you kind of do some digging and 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 you know educating yourself on what's out there. Um, but yeah, definitely do your research and I'm I'm here. Yes. Send me the resume. Thank you. See, this is what it's all about, making sure that we're supporting one another. Yes. Um, Elisa and Jesse, I am so grateful for the time that y'all have given us um, and sharing your stories. As a fellow light-skinned La Afro-Latina, I'm very <laughs> just grateful for y'all to be able to just do what you're doing in the spaces and also making sure that you're getting your flowers while doing so. Because so much of the emotional labor you all do along with like the labor labor okay. is often unseen. So thank you again for, for doing what you do. Um, everyone, thank you so much for being part of this session. Um, we have a lot more going on. So please feel free to check out the sessions that are happening. Um, hit up our our panelists on LinkedIn. I hope that's okay for me to say to you. <laughs> say to you um, and yeah, keep keep connecting and and increasing la comunidad. Um, thank you so much, y'all. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.